Welcome um, to the UIL seminar series. Today is the first seminar in the UIL seminar series uh, by uh, Al Cooper. Don't think Al needs any introduction here. I'd like to uh, pass two remarks. And uh, Al received the Distinguished Achievement Award for 2013 this year for his uh, role in integrating 14 externally developed instruments. I don't know what 14 in instruments are there, but I know for sure I closely worked with him on Hyper Cloud Radar and other instruments. This LAMS is, I guess, internally developed instruments where Al is reporting today. Uh, with that, I'd like to in, uh, invite Al for his uh, talk. Um, thank you, Al. Good, thank you. I'm glad to be able to talk about this, and thanks for coming to what might seem like a dry title. I'm going to be talking about calibrations of things, but I think it might be an interesting application that, uh, and I'll try to do a little bit of background presentation on the basic ways of how we measure some things. I want to emphasize that I'm not going to be really talking much about the LAMS, the Laser Air Motion Sensing System itself. Rather, I'm going to emphasize how it has led to some improvements in basic measurements that we make from the RAF aircraft. Uh, Scott Spuler and the team developing this have published a very nice article in Applied Optics that describes this in some detail. So, uh, and at some point I'll give you a reference to that. Uh, if you want more information about it, that's the place to, to look. I've listed a few people that have added to this. There are a number of other people too. Uh, Dirk Richter made significant contributions to the optical uh, electronic aspects of, of this. Uh, some of the people at RAF, especially the uh, REF technicians have made significant contributions and uh, I've had very interesting discussions with Jan Jensen over a lot of this. So there's a whole s set of other people that I've not included here, but it is a, an effort of quite a large team. This is the outline of what I'm going to say. I'm not going to go through that here and tell you except just in general terms, but the reason I showed it was to point out that there is an outline that sits up here and it will get highlighted as I go through. So if you want to, you can kind of follow how I'm doing and how far I have to go and how much more of this you have to listen to before I get to the, 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 the summary. I'm going to start out by describing how we make some of the basic measurements, uh, emphasizing temperature, pressure, and airspeed. And the problem is that we're doing that from an airplane that's flying uh, above 40,000 feet and flying at uh, over 200 meters per second. So that introduces a lot of complications in how you do measurements of even simple things like this. And I want to talk about how we do that as background for showing the impact that the LAMS has had on these measurements. Let me start with temperature. It's measured by a sensor that looks like this. It stands about three inches out from the skin of the aircraft, and air flows in this way and out through uh, exits at the back of this. There's a platinum resistance wire in there, and the measurement of that tells us the temperature of the, the wire. Internally, it looks like this. Air flows in, down and around the wire, and out through a number of exits. The problem is that in the process of entering and reaching this sensor, the air is slowed down and therefore compressed by quite a bit. And associated with that compression is heating. So you don't measure the right temperature. You measure a temperature that is increased by, in the case of the G5, quite a bit. Here's a plot of how much it's changed uh, down at uh, 100 meters per second at a relatively slow speed aircraft, the correction's about five degrees. By the time you get up to 200 to 250 meters per second, it's 20 to 30 degrees. So we're having to correct for a very large increase in temperature produced by this, this compression. That's the, the problem. We have to know not just 
how to measure the temperature of that wire, but how much the airspeed is affecting it, and in addition, how the sensor itself behaves. Does it behave as if the air is brought exactly to rest or almost to rest? I'll talk more about that. So there's already a coupling between the airspeed and the velocity, which is what LAMS is going to measure for us. Now, if I look at pressure, the pressure is measured by little ports on the side of the aircraft called static buttons. I've enlarged it here, so you can see that there's two sources here. And scattered around the aircraft are a number of these. Uh, the avionics for the aircraft uses one to know what the pressure is in flight. And we have put ours near the location of the, the avionics sensor. So there's a transducer connected to that port that measures the pressure. And of course, then the question is, is that the real pressure at the level at which the aircraft is flying? I want to point out before I leave this picture that there are two tubes up here that I'm going to talk about in just a minute, uh, pitot tubes. And when I talk about them, you can recall that they're located up here at the nose of the aircraft. The problem is illustrated here. This is a pressure distribution along a line that goes along the fuselage of the aircraft. And it starts out with a zero correction out in the free stream, rises up to a value conventionally called Q or QC that is the maximum dynamic pressure that would occur at a stagnation point. And this can be as much as 100 millibars or more in the case of the, the G5. Then there's a decrease along the fuselage, a deficit, an increase again, a deficit, or in this case, over the wings as the lift of the wings is developed. And the target then is to find one of these zero crossings. The G5 uses this one and put the static buttons there in order to get as accurate a measurement as you can. Well, of course, the difficulty is that there are pressure perturbations that vary with the speed of the aircraft, with the Mach number, with the angle of attack, with the side slip, and with the loading of the aircraft. And so there are errors here. And if this is 100 millibars, you can imagine that these can easily be several millibars in, in, in magnitude, even if we put that at the selected best point. So let me turn to airspeed then. There's a magnified view of that pitot tube. The air comes in this way, is transmitted to a pressure sensor. We actually use a differential sensor between this and the uh, connection to those static buttons in order to be able to measure it more accurately. But in effect, it measures the difference between this total pressure produced at the pitot tube and what's measured at the buttons. If everything works right, that can be used to calculate what the velocity of the aircraft is. But of course, there's the, the problem that we're referencing this to the pressure system for the aircraft that we get from those static buttons. And any error there comes right into this calculation. So even if this delivers the right total pressure, which we think it does, the error in the pressure measurement then affects this dynamic pressure, the difference between those two. And the effect can be several meters per second in the calculated airspeed. So the problem is all three of these are coupled together in complicated ways. And just to show some of the math of how that all works, uh, this shows how you calculate temperature or airspeed. Let me start by temperature. The temperature of the air is what the sensor actually sees. These red quantities are the three measurements, total uh, ambient pressure and what the sensor sees. And you have to change it by this factor, which depends on the Mach number, uh, parameter alpha, conventionally called the recovery factor, which is a characteristic of the probe, and constants, which are gas constant and uh, specific heat at constant volume. So the temperature you get using the Mach number, the Mach number depends on these two pressures. So all three measurements are coming into the measurement of temperature 
in important ways, in ways that uh, it is sensitive enough to that they affect any error analysis. Airspeed also is dependent on the same measurements. And the easiest way to see this is that the, the velocity is the Mach number times the square root of gamma, that's the ratio of specific heats, uh, the gas constant, and the absolute temperature. So once we get the temperature from this, this is an absolute temperature, then we can get the velocity this way. But the velocity, again, depends on all of those, those measurements. It's even more complicated. I've put primes on this because you really ought to use gas constants and specific heats corrected for the humidity of the air. And if that's significant, it can have an important effect, especially at relatively low altitude. This can make uh, an important change in the calculated velocity and even in the, the temperature. So there's really a four-way link here between temperature, pressure, airspeed, and humidity. The result is that we end up with a really complicated analysis of uncertainty for any of this, and that the uncertainties are quite correlated. So let me turn to the LAMS, which is what I'm going to argue has provided us an opportunity to make an important improvement in all of those uncertainties. This development started back in the 90s. Don Lenshaw and others began arguing for this as a way of measuring the velocity of the air away from the aircraft before all the distortion around the aircraft is a factor. If you can measure with a laser beam the velocity uh, tens of meters ahead of the aircraft, then you have no airflow distortion, and the, the measurement can be a, a, a relatively exact measurement. There was a project, well, I should stay on this for just a second, because one of the key contributors here is in the, the audience. This was a project that was uh, initiated by Ron Suizo, and Jeff Keeler was uh, involved in that. They began the development of a 10.6 micron system, and that was pursued for quite a while as an instrument for airborne use. 10.6 microns is especially hard because the aerosol concentration at 10.6 microns is pretty low. And so that, that had a lot going against it, and it never really panned out, but was an important predecessor and uh, a way of convincing us all that this was a, an important way to go. And uh, Don continued to push for the reason that Scientifically, he knew that this was the way to get around all the airflow effects on the, the aircraft. Now, in 2007, Mike Spowart initiated a project which would uh, develop a new system. And that's led to the system we called LAMS, Laser Air Motion Sensor. It is uh, the, the development that has been conducted over the last few years in 2009, Scott Spuler and Dirk Richter joined the team, bringing expertise from elsewhere in EOL on uh, especially the optical aspects of this that have been, that, that has been quite important to the project. And this resulted in some early flights of a system in 2010 <laughs> and some more in 2011 that are the subject of what I'm going to talk about. This is a one beam system. It, uh, was documented very well in a paper by Scott and the team in Applied Optics in 2011. And the project has continued. We are now looking at test flights recently conducted with a three-beam system, and there will be a four-beam system that will be constructed in the future, partly as a result of the kind of analyses that I'm going to talk about, because the fourth beam is the result of us realizing that the single beam pointed straight forward is very valuable. And that even if we have a system where there are three beams pointing in a cone in different directions ahead, that the straightforward direction is very valuable for giving us the reference airspeed. This is the diagram from Scott's paper 
what I want to point out is that the, the system has the laser and detector internal in the aircraft. Then there are fiber optic fibers that, that, that carry this to uh, a wing pod where there's a lens and it's focused. The distance has varied from uh, 12 and a half to 30 meters ahead of the, the window. Then aerosols backscatter light. That light is carried back to a detector and the Doppler shift is, is measured. These are the characteristics. It's one and a half microns, much more favorable for atmospheric measurements than the 10.6 was. Uh, it measures the Doppler shift directly. It also has uh, an inertial reference unit mounted in the pod next to it so that if there is motion of the pod or the wing around, we measure that and can correct for the small angular changes that, that occur. The team's analysis of this has led to a precision of about uh, five hundredths of a meter per second and an uncertainty of about a tenth of a meter per second in the direct measurement, the line of sight measurement. So that's the LAM system that I'm going to be talking about that has been developed and tested here. Now this provides something really valuable in that matrix of interconnected measurements. It tells us an absolute measurement of something. We don't have an absolute measurement. We don't have a tower extending to 45,000 feet that we can fly by and measure the, the temperature and compare or know any of the references for those quantities. So having something to pin these analyses on can be very valuable. It can cascade well beyond just the airspeed measurement to the other measurements as well. And this is nice because it is based on the Doppler shift. And so with a precise knowledge of the wavelength, we know that shift without calibration, without any uncertainties, except that of finding the peak in the, the return spectrum. To the extent that that can be done well, this is an absolute measurement. And the consequences first, with GPS, GPS also now provides this kind of accuracy for the motion of the aircraft. And a wind measurement is motion of the air relative to the aircraft plus motion of the aircraft relative to the ground. GPS provides aircraft relative to the ground. So the sum of those two with LAMS now gives us an uncertainty on the order of a tenth of a meter per second in the longitudinal measurement of wind. That's well beyond what I would have claimed before all of this. This reduced uncertainty in relative velocity or airspeed can also be reduced, uh, be used to reduce uncertainties in some of the other measurements. Um, temperature is a good example. In the case of temperature, I showed the correction for dynamic heating before, dependent on the square of the velocity and having an accurate velocity with which to correct the temperature helps in trying to reduce that uncertainty. It helps further in ways that I'll talk about later in the talk, but that's the first obvious connection. Next, I'm going to argue that not only does it improve in those ways, but it can be used to measure, to, to improve the measurement of, of pressure. Oh. So the key to the pressure measurement and why this helps in pressure is a result of pitot tube design. Pitot tubes are designed to be insensitive to flow angles a few degrees from the axis of the tube. So if the aircraft changes or there's turbulence or other uh, changes in the airspeed relative to the aircraft, within a few degrees, the pitot tube doesn't uh, respond to that. It still measures the right total pressure. Uh, furthermore, the pitot tube is nice because it doesn't, it, it's not affected by flow distortion in the sense that it doesn't matter what kind of a path the air takes around the aircraft to the stagnation point as long as it reaches the stagnation point. So if it flows up and partly over the nose and into the pitot tube, as long as it gets to a stagnation point and energy is conserved, we get the same total pressure. So if we can 
count on the accuracy of this total pressure, then we can start to analyze the other components, the ambient and the dynamic pressure uh, as a result. And this shows how this works. Recall I said the dynamic pressure, Q, is measured as the difference between the total, like at the pitot tube, and the static or ambient pressure, like at the static buttons. If we think this is accurate, then any error in Q is just the opposite of the error in P. So if we can correct Q, if we can find what the error in Q is, we know that the error in pressure is exactly the negative of that. And so we can use that to correct the, the pressure. But the important thing about LAMS is because it measures the velocity, it measures Q, or at least it predicts Q. You can use the uh, measurements and LAMS to say what Q should have been. So you can find out a Q predicted by LAMS, compare that to Q measured, that's the error, and you can say, okay, that error is not only the error in Q, but minus the error in P, so we can correct the pressure uh, accordingly. This is very nice. Let me try to convince you that that pressure is, is accurate. Pardon me. There's a couple of lines of evidence that argue for this, the validity of that uh, total pressure measurement. One is that both of the RAF aircraft have two independent sets of pressure measurements. Independent static buttons, independent pitot tubes, and the G5, the second one is part of the avionics. The C-130 has two research systems and then a third that is the avionics. So we can compare the total pressure from all of those and we ought to get the same answer from each of those pairs. This compares one set to a completely independent set for total pressure measurement. And the RMS error from the one-to-one -one line is about a tenth of a millibar. The error, if I do a best fit to that line, uh, not constrained to the values measured by one, is about four hundredths of uh, a millibar. So they're responding to the same thing. They wouldn't have this kind of a correlation unless they were seeing the same thing. And in fact, the two systems measure the two components quite differently. They measure a different dynamic pressure and different static pressure or ambient pressure. But when you add them together, you get the same thing. So this is support for the argument that that total pressure measurement is accurate and we can count on that. We also did a specific analysis of how side slip affects this in order to see if there's a detectable dependence on angle of the, the pressure measurement. This is a plot of the total pressure measured at the inlet to a pitot tube as the side slip angle is varied through, this is actually the absolute value of the side slip angle, and it's varied through a range out to about three degrees, which is the limit of what the G5 normally encounters in angles relative to the, the pitot tube. And you can see this is consistent to within about a tenth of a millibar. This is two tenths here and minus two tenths, so all of these are consistent with an argument that uh, this is accurate to a tenth and that there's no sensitivity to that. Uh, that there are some corrections, of course, that had to go into this because as you fly these maneuvers, there are small altitude changes and that has a much larger effect on the pressure, so you have to correct for the altitude change and correct for the airspeed change if there is one by using the LAMS measurement. Once you do those two corrections, this comes out very solid. So that's the basis for us thinking that if we use the total pressure measurement, we can use LAMS to find what our pressure error is and therefore correct it. Okay, some more math just to illustrate how this all links together. Uh, the Mach number is related to the pressure and dynamic pressure in this way where there is uh, in the right side of this equation, 
no dependence except those two measurements and characteristics of the error. Um, given that, you can solve for Q, and you get that Q depends on the velocity and linearly on pressure and in a somewhat complicated way on the, the temperature. But it's relatively insensitive to these two. I say that because uh, it's proportional, the Q is proportional to P, but it's normally maybe a tenth of what P is. And so uh, an error in P becomes a tenth of that error in Q. And similarly, the error in temperature is the fractional error of the absolute temperature. And so that's a few percent. So the main factor here is the velocity that LAMS measures. And we can iterate this. We can say, use the pressure that we measured, find Q, and then correct it and do it again in order to find what the, the real value of Q is. So with iteration, this prediction of Q has an uncertainty that is also about a tenth of a hectopascal. So with that prediction, we now think we can predict what the Q ought to be to a tenth of a hectopascal, and therefore what the pressure correction should be. This shows how important this correction is. This is a plot of the dynamic pressure deduced from LAMS. And here, what is actually measured. And you can see the measurements are several millibars above the prediction from LAMS. It's saying we have an error of several millibars. And not only that, but I think there's a, yeah. There's both a bias and an RMS scatter here. Uh, there's a bias in the mean, but at any point, there's a scatter around that value. And so it's not just a simple take the value that you measure and apply a linear correction. It's more complicated than that. And the, the LAMS is telling us that there are dependence there, dependences there that are beyond just a linear calculation. The, the point is this is very important to make this accurately. I do want to say because uh, RAF would be sensitive to this otherwise, that past measurements are not this bad, that corrections have been applied based on other evidence to the pressure measurements, but they're also not this good. This is the best by far that we've been able to predict this, this pressure measurement. But I don't want to leave the impression that we're mismeasuring pressure by three millibars. Uh, it, it's considerably better than that even before land. Now I'm going to try to show fits to the functional dependence of the, the correction to pressure. And I need to explain why I want to do that. Why not just use LAMS directly to correct the, the, the pressure? Well, first, LAMS might not always be in operation. So if we can calculate what the correction is on the basis of other measurements on the aircraft, like static and dynamic pressure and angle of attack, then we can make the correction even if LAMS is not in operation. Or the ambient aerosol might not be providing enough backscatter for LAMS to work. That happens sometimes. And in that case, we still can make a correction. Uh, furthermore, if we develop functional representations of these corrections, they can be applied to past projects. So we can go back and reprocess and improve the accuracy of the accumulated measurements. Now there's one uh, subtlety here that I need to explain because it affects the accuracy of a lot of this. And that is that you recall the LAM sample volume is ahead of a point on the wing. And so it's displaced from the fuselage. It's displaced out to the location where the pod was under the wing. And it's seeing a point uh, typically 10 or 30 meters ahead of that point. But what's being measured by the pitot tube is at a point on the fuselage. So these are separated in space. And if you're in a turbulent field, they might have different velocities. You might have different velocities there versus here, even in the absence of the aircraft. And that will introduce some variation in all of this uh, analysis. That's another reason for trying to do these fits. 
because these turbulent fluctuations can affect the, the value. But if you accumulate a large number of points, you would expect them to average out. If their speed is too high one time, it's probably too low sometime in the future to, to average out so that the effect on the fit gets the right answer, even though there are errors in the, the individual measurements. So those are the reasons why I want to represent the corrections in functional form. And I tried a lot of different dependencies. These are five that showed some correlation to the error in dynamic pressure. Mach number and powers of Mach number. The pressure itself, the error seems to be about linear in pressure. The angle of attack and powers of the angle of attack. The Q itself, but once you have Q, there's enough ambiguity in Q and the series of powers of Mach number that they're not really independent, and you don't need Q if you include these, or vice versa. And also, there's a sensitivity to the side slip angle. Unlike the pitot tube, the static buttons on the side of the aircraft are sensitive to the side slip angle. And so there can be an effect from, from that. And it turned out to be minor, but it was detectable. So here's the best fit resulting from a lot of tries of functions like that. And this is the full fit, but it can be fit pretty well by just using a Mach term, a Mach squared term, and an angle of attack term. This is angle of attack being expressed as the pressure differences measured on the radome, which lead to angle of attack. So you can think of this ratio as the angle of attack. And uh, there's even a cubic dependence on the angle of attack and on the Mach number in terms of the, the full dependence. But the variance doesn't change much if you eliminate uh, a lot of those least, less sensitive terms and just use a few terms in this e expression. But I'm going to use this in the analysis because that's the, that's the best. If I do that, then I get this kind of an error. This is the difference between the pressure correction implied by lambs and the function of Mach number and all those parameters that come from that functional fit that I showed on the last slide. And the, the standard error here is about 3 tenths of a hectopascal. So we've removed that 3 or so hectopascal variance in the difference and replaced it with 3 tenths. In fact, the the, the variance has been, uh, well, 96% of the variance is accounted for by this, this fit. R squared is 0.96. And furthermore, if we estimate the effect of turbulence in making the difference that I was talking about between the sample volumes, that approximately accounts for the size of this uh, width. That it's not inconsistent to say that this is entirely from the effects of turbulence in the data set that I used. So uh, all I can say is that I think we're within three tenths of a millibar, but it might be better. But I think the, the fit is very well constrained. There are a, a large number of points that go into this, and the uncertainty in the fit coefficients is very low. So uh, I really think it's better than this three tenths of a millibar. There it is, 20,000 measurements went into this. So here's the summary of what it did for pressure. Lambs predicted to Q, and the measurements are improved, both in Q and P, by this kind of fit. I put quotes around the improved because I'm arguing that the lambs led to corrections, which when applied are even better than using the lambs directly. That's the sense in which this is improved. We have a representation of the error in pressure in terms of standard measurements not dependent on lands. They can be applied to old data. Standard error is something like 3 tenths or better, millibar. And if I use the same procedure to correct the dynamic pressure to calculate the airspeed, you get an airspeed with about a three tenths of a meter per second standard error also, but uh, just as in the 
earlier argument, it's probably accurate to a tenth of a meter per second instead, even as corrected. The LAMS tells us within a tenth of a meter per second, but it might be the displaced sample volume. So that's what it's done for pressure. There's an important consequence, and I didn't want this to go by without emphasizing it. And that is that we now have a way of measuring pressure to high accuracy and of measuring height to high accuracy. Height comes from the GPS. And GPS measurements these days are spectacular. Uh, uncertainties in the centimeter or so range are uh, achievable. Uh, if measurements of P are available to a tenth of a millibar, then we should have new opportunities for the study of dynamics in mapping mesoscale pressure fields. We can map those where you have, for example, the height field that you would plot on a conventional pressure map has an uncertainty of about one meter. And you often see contours with 10 meters or so on those height maps. So this is a very good accuracy to use in studies. It, it enables a whole series of studies that we haven't been able to support before. OK, I have here a set of slides supporting the accuracy of this. I think I'm going to skip them just because the time is working out that way and tell you what they were uh, in very abbreviated form. I've tested this by comparison directly to the avionics system on the aircraft, which is certified for a more accurate measurement than many systems are certified. It's certified to what is called RVSM standards. And that means it's accurate to about 80 feet or to on the order of a millibar. And our measurements are consistent with that, so that's the test we ought to meet. I also looked at a number of reverse heading maneuvers to see that reverse heading is where you fly downwind and then turn around and fly back upwind over the same range. And your longitudinal component of the wind should reverse sign in the uh, two legs and compared those. And they do reverse sign to an accuracy of about a tenth of a meter per second in a set of 10 reverse heading maneuvers. So those support the kind of accuracies that I'm, I'm talking about. And I'm going to skip the details of that. Let me turn to the temperature calibration. Once you have a pressure that you can count on, you can start to think about trying to calculate what the temperature should be through altitude changes. Because the hydrostatic equation relates pressure, temperature, and altitude. So if we trust what we have for the altitude change from the GPS and what we have from pressure through our LAMS corrected pressure system, we ought to be able to deduce what the temperature is. Well, the accuracies that are required here are beyond what we can do on a second by second basis because even with a tenth of a millibar accuracy, uh, this is not adequate to give us a, an accurate enough measurement of, of temperature. So you have to do one of two things. You have to use climbs and descents where you have maybe 100 seconds worth of, or, or more of uh, data, and then calculate uh, a mean temperature. Or even better, uh, I've done that, but I'm not going to show those. Uh, even better, I think, is to say, Suppose you take this as what you expect and use all the measurements from a large data set to do a minimization of the error that arises in temperature if you assume that you're going to apply a correction to your measured temperature that is linear, that is an A0 and a 1 plus A1. So A0 and A1, you'd like to come out 0 or very small. And you can then determine what is required in order to get the best fit to a large set of, of measurements. And here's the math again. <coughs> the key here is let's start with the second equation that says this is the height change from second to second. It's related to the temperature, and I'm going to use this correct temperature, where the correction is including these to the measured temperature. And then in addition, the dynamic heating, because that gets me back to ambient temperature. And that's what I need for the hydrostatic equation. 
So use the temperature here and the log of the pressure ratio measured to predict the height between each second uh, value. And then compare that, those heights to what you actually measure, z, from the GPS, and calculate a grand chi-square from a large data set. So I used the HIPPO-5 project, where we had 10 flights that were mostly going up and down and up and down and up and down the whole way uh, to, uh, to the southern hemisphere and beyond, oh, and, ba and back. So there are 122 profiles in that, a large data set, and then do a grand minimization of this whole thing to find what C0 and C1 is required in order to minimize this, this chi-square and see if I can determine what the correction is to the temperature in that way. And I have a bunch of details here. Again, I'm going to skip except to leave it there in the, for a second in case you want to try to read it fast. You have to do a lot of data quality checks, avoid times when the data are bad and avoid when the aircraft is not climbing or descending. And um, otherwise, make sure that there are not errors in the data because very small subsets of the data can make a big distortion in the, the result. But after doing that, you get that these coefficients are 0.3 degrees and the slope correction is 0.007. <coughs> so it's a pretty small correction. It's important, I think, that this is a test of the complete system. We do bath calibrations of the sensors themselves in order to find out what the resistance of that sensor is versus temperature. Uh, we use A to D analog to digital recording. Uh, an analog voltage is a calculated from the resistance of the wire. And there's the recovery factor that I've been talking about that has to be applied. If any of those are wrong, they're going to affect this because this result affects the whole chain. So we're getting a result that tests our entire temperature calculation. Now, the result looks like this. Um, it's about zero at the low temperatures where the G5 frequently flies. Uh, this temperature is the sense temperature, and so it might be 20 degrees or so or more warmer than the actual ambient temperature. But at low temperatures, this is uh, showing that we have a very accurate measurement. And surprising to us, uh, the errors are at the relatively high temperatures where we get errors as much as a half a degree. I should thank the ISF folks and the calibration folks along the way here because we changed this bath calibration recently to use the ISF facilities and it made a big difference. We didn't get nearly this good a result until we did that recalibration in the, the ISF facilities. So our corrections are pretty small, but the uncertainty is also constrained pretty well. You can calculate this uncertainty in two ways. One is just use the fit procedure and the fit coefficients themselves. The fit procedure tells you how much you can vary them and increase the chi-square by uh, an amount that would correspond to one standard deviation. And that indicates that we know this correction to maybe 0.15 degrees. The other way I did this was to evaluate it by splitting the data set into four groups and finding the answer to each one of those four subsets and finding the average and the standard error. And the standard error among those is about three-tenths of a degree. And if you say what is then the, the mean of four, that's about 0.17. So you get a, a consistent result. Now, this is important, I think, because it's a guard against having bad data included. If we had bad measurements where something should have been excluded and my data review just didn't catch it, then it is likely it would apply to one of those data sets, not to all four equally, and that I'd catch it this way. So the fact that no group is an outlier, I think, is an important part of that test. My note tells me I'd better skip one thing here, which is very interesting, and maybe I'll have time to return to that 
Let me try to conclude so that I'll have lots of time for questions. Uh, this is a summary of what the calibrations have done for us. The longitudinal wind reduced the uncertainty to about a tenth of a meter per second. We expected that one. We didn't expect these others uh, at the time of the development. The pressure uncertainty has been reduced to definitely less than three tenths of a millibar, and I think probably on the range of a tenth of a millibar. And the temperature uncertainty, with correction, has been reduced to about two tenths of a degree uh, throughout the flight envelope. Those are all, well, approaching an order of magnitude, but maybe a factor of five better than I would have said before all of this started. So it's quite a significant <coughs> effect that LAMS has had on the measurements. And I therefore want to uh, anticipate first what's going to happen next. The 3D system has been tested and we're trying to look at that. Four beam systems under development and we expect to reduce the uncertainty in the 3D wind in a similar way. But I do want to emphasize that the, thanks to the LAMS development team for creating this, it really has an important impact on our support for projects and opens the possibility for many measurements in the future that we couldn't make before. And I'll leave time for some questions. Uh, thank you. Britt. How much has to change before you have to recalculate all of your uh, five a1 through A5 coefficients. I mean, if the, loading, if the loading on the plane changes, do they have to change? The loading on the plane doesn't seem to do that because what that does is it changes the angle of attack, and the angle of attack is in the parameterization. Uh, but your question is good because we did get caught uh, in exactly that way. We found uh, when a new radome was put on the G5 that the calculation changed, that the corrections changed. And it, the reason is that I had parameterized these in terms of delta P over delta Q rather than in terms of angle of attack. I should have used angle of attack, and then when you change the radome, you get a new function for angle of attack, and you put that in, and there's no change. But we saw a change and then realized, ah, I did that wrong. We've now corrected that. So I, don't think, I don't think this changes in a significant way unless you do something to the radome, and then have to compensate for that. But does this help for the vertical velocity estimates, or are we waiting for the 3D version of this to improve those? And, and what's the uncertainty of in W? W is harder than V, uh, not only because of the Uh, of the, the, this is looking ahead, and we now need something that looks up if we're going to do W well. And even the three beam system goes at an angle, so it will tell us W, but it won't tell us W as well as it would by just looking straight up. Uh, it's further complicated because the INS, which is providing the conventional measurement of, of velocity, works better in the horizontal than it does in the vertical. And so we have some problems with W. And the W uncertainty uh, does depend on further study with the lands. The main way that that's going to help us is that it will let us calibrate better the angle of attack. We calibrate the angle of attack now on the aircraft by flying and then changing angle of attack and seeing uh, you simultaneously change angle of attack and pitch. They ought to change by the same amount. So you can calculate what the new angle of attack is by using the pitch change during those, those maneuvers. But that has an imprecision that, that could be improved by the, the more precise measurements from LAMS. So I anticipate W will be better, but I can't make an estimate right now. I, I don't think it's better than a half a meter per second now. You mentioned this, and I missed it, but what is the sampling time that typically goes in for these measurements, for example, LAMS or some of the other sensors? 
the lambs is sampled at very high rate and averaged. So I'm using mostly one second values here, but you can use about any rate you want. Uh, the uncertainty becomes greater because as you average over a longer uh, range, you reduce the uncertainty in what the, the mean of that is. But it's no problem getting 100 hertz measurements from the lambs or even higher if there were a reason to do it. Because it's measuring, Scott, how many, or Scott? Scott, how many samples per second? 200,000. So there's a large number that goes into all of these averages. Um, Al, how turbulent were the environments that you flew in? Um, well, I've quoted typical RMS values here, and that might be one way of characterizing it as three tenths of a meter per second or so. The problem is that I use large data sets in order to do this. Once I get up high, things are nice and calm, and there isn't much problem. But I needed the span down to the low Mach numbers also. And so that went down into the boundary layer. And there, the measurements were turbulent. So three tenths of a meter per second variant uh, Standard error, I guess that's the kind of variance that there is. Yeah, I, I was just wondering if if it really bore out that uh, um, the turbulence caused the wind speed at the pod to be different than what what the side of the airplane actually saw. If, well, that's, if, if you could really say, yep, they're different. That was the calculation that I did do. Uh, assume that there's an eddy dissipation rate of this take this variance spectrum and measure it and say, okay, the variance spectrum indicates that the eddy dissipation rate is this. That implies that the difference in velocity between points separated by this much is three tenths of a meter per second. And that was the calculation that led to that prediction that, yes, we're pretty consistent with what you would expect for a turbulent field. But of course, it's taking the boundary layer part of that. Uh, it gets better when you go up high. Um. I was curious if it, uh, when you started, you had a neat plot of uh, where you thought uh, the static pressure was zero. You had a, a delta P over a Q, and you had the sides of the airplane. Yes. Uh, do all these do all these corrections imply that spot wasn't exactly nailed, or that spot was uh, dependent on wind speed and things like that? Let's see if I can ever get back enough clicks here to. I should have done a jump here. This part. Yeah, that one. The placement of this by Gulfstream, I think, is probably good. They choose the best spot they can find. Of course, they choose the very best spot. So we now have to put it someplace near there. And we try to put it someplace where we think it's going to, to work equally well. But even in this plot, you can see this is a slope through there that's rapidly going off by millibars if we miss exactly the right location. So it's easily conceivable that this can be off by a few millibars, even at the best. And then you start changing flight conditions and Mach numbers and uh, loading of the aircraft and all of that. And that's where I think the errors come from. Yeah, that's why I was curious whether it is, is a lot of the error just the fact that that curve changes with all the flight conditions and things like that. Yeah, yeah this, is a, this is a steady flow calculation. Um, this is a CW laser, right? It's a continuous wave laser. Uh, yes. So, so have you played with like the focus point from the wing? You know, from like the averaging volume, how that will change the velocity you get. Uh, we have someone inadvertently <laughs> for our last test. We we did see some uh, slowing in one of the beams that was too close to the fuselage, as we would expect. But right now, we've been trying to for most of these tests that Al was looking at this. The beam was quite far away, um, and we did not systematically move the beam in to. Uh, to look at different, uh, to look at the um, stagnation as you got closer to the aircraft. But also, 
correct yeah as, as you go to with the geometry as you go to a, a longer beam the sample volume gets longer longer correct right so uh, they're correct yeah. let me just mention one of the things that I skipped because I think it's a nice result an unexpected result that is that you can measure temperature with the lambs without any reference to a temperature sensor on the aircraft. And the argument is that lambs measures the velocity. <coughs> the pressure sensors now calibrated better measure the Mach number. If I know the Mach number and the velocity, I know the speed of sound, and therefore I know the temperature. Because speed of sound is only a function of temperature. So we can use this to measure temperature independent of any sensor on the aircraft. And we've tried that, and it seems to work reasonably well. The exciting part about that is that in cloud, we ought to get return from the cloud hydrometers instead of the aerosols, and we ought to be able to measure temperature in cloud. And that's been a difficult thing for a long time to get a valid measurement of. So we're, we're pursuing that and hope that that will work out. And I think that's one of the very exciting things about it. And I have a question. Um, assume all the analysis based on the single beam lamps, what you yes. did. Uh, could you comment on the 3D and 4D uh, beams, what you're going to achieve? Well, it's still in an evolving state. We did the three beam system and tested that. And when we calculated the mean speed, which ought to be easy to calculate from the geometry, we got the wrong answer. And so we're trying to understand why. And there are two leading guesses. One is that the angle of at least one of those beams is mismeasured and we need to adjust it. But we need to adjust it by a degree, and Scott tells me he knows it to a hundredth of a degree. So uh, that seems unlikely. The other is that the three spots around the aircraft, the one to the right and down, gets below the fuselage about uh, 10 meters, if I remember right. And that's getting where there might be flow effects there. And if that's the problem, then that will compromise our measurements and mean that we need to go out further in order to have that all work. But we're still trying to pursue that. So that's why I didn't come in here and talk about the three B. We haven't solved that problem. Oh, I have a question. I was wondering in the beginning, you mentioned the I remember at the beginning, you mentioned the moisture factor that goes into the heat capacity and the uh, uh, gas constant. But later on in the calibration pressure or pressure uh, and temperature, I didn't notice there's a moisture factor, could you comment on, is it really negligible, or at what kind of a pressure altitude is negligible? Thank you. Well, in fact, I did use the moisture correction in everything I did. So if I left out some of those primes, it was just an omission. But I, I did use the, the correction. It is completely insignificant at 40 or 50,000 feet. But it's very important in the boundary layer. So the importance of this varies from it can, be, uh, it can be as much as a meter per second or more at low level, and it can be neglected at high level because the moisture is so low. Uh, 